everyone. Thank you very much for being with us today. We're truly happy to welcome you back on board for our third season and second episode of our 360 Degrees of Product Design Masterclass series. Uh, in last than three episodes, we are covering the full workflow of product design with today diving into the UX design matrix. A little bit of our fantastic speaker's background. David, Mr. David Renou is Managing Director at NeoPixel, a leading digital agency specialized in development of mobile and web applications in Luxembourg since 2011, combining technical and UX design expertise. Having joined the group Smile, European lead in open source innovation, NeoPixel became a knowledge center delivering more than 40 applications per year in Europe. NeoPixel is also specialized in training UX designers from beginners to advanced at universities and corporates with over 1,700 smile liens, they serve their clients at each step of the transformation cycle. Together with Antoine Basemont, their UX leader, they'll be giving a workshop on UX design sprint right after the panel discussion. We have a true hybrid on the board. Mr. Leandro Lima is in direction design at Google, joining us from the Munich office in Germany, originally from Brazil. Uh, Leandro Lima has been designing online products since 2008. Pro previously, he worked for Klarna, one of the Europe's largest banks with more than 60 million customers and, and 1 million tr uh, transactions per day. From 2016 to 2019, he worked, he, <clears throat> he worked at Booking.com, helping loyalty programs to grow to millions of users per day. For seven years, he worked at his own design company, Pop-Up Design, based in Sao Paulo. Leandro will be giving a workshop on, on how to design in a culture of A-B tasks. Finally, joining the panel discussion is one of the most, one of the busiest and most radiant women in Barcelona, uh, Ms. Paula Mariani, Director of U User Experience at N26, originally from Argentina. Ms. Mariani uh, is a true global citizen with an incredible international track record to say the very least today to, uh, today 20 um, and 26 has more than 7 million customers in 25 markets that generate over 2 billion in monthly transaction volume the company employs more than 1500 employees across eight global off office locations with a full uh, european banking license state of the art technology and no branch network miss mariani is leading the ux design practice globally thank you so much mariani for making us the honor to be with us. On the bottom other side, we have uh, Mr. Armin Prijaja, uh, part of the customer experience yeah. strategy consulting at PwC. He focuses his work on the human experience in a highly collaborative manner. Armin helps companies use design thinking, whether focusing on technology or business, rallying behind a shared vision of the future, reimagined around the experience of their brand. Ladies and gentlemen, Armin, the screen is yours. Thanks, uh, Anthony, and I think I will for sure try to change my uh, surname <laughs> next time to make it a bit easier for you. <laughs> I think nobody has ever guessed it, but uh, well, um, thank you for all the, um, the panelists that have joined today. I think we have a really diverse crowd today. I'm, I'm so excited to be able to uh, moderate this panel. Uh, so um, just to kick us off, I would like to do a small icebreaker. So it's a surprise for, I think, everybody here and for panelists. Um, and it's called uh, uh, One Superpower. So um, I'll give an example starting with myself. So uh, my superpower is that uh, I speak uh, five languages, uh, but not French, <laughs> which uh, is very unfortunate if you live in Luxembourg, I can tell you that. Uh, so maybe we can go with you, Paula. Uh, what is your one superpower that uh, you could share with us? My superpower is that I'm a Kundalini yoga teacher. So I wow. can rock your emotional world. Nice. Nice. Well, thank you. Leonardo, would you like to go next? Yes. Um, so my superpower is that before I became a designer, I was a professional football player. So I know how to be a good goalkeeper, but I'm better designer. Nice. <laughs> well, we'll just have to trust you on that. Uh, David, would you like to go next? Hello, everybody. So I would say my superpower is uh, really uh, my high motivation despite any problems I can, uh, I can, I can feel. Well, that's uh, very good to, to have as a UX designers because we are very emotional, get uh, very quickly demotivated, I guess. 
Uh, and Antoine, would you like to, to go? Um, yeah, maybe uh, it's really simple, but uh, maybe just I'm, I'm a smiling guy, so that's it. <laughs> nice. <laughs> well, uh, uh, thank you, everyone. So um, let's jump right into the questions. So uh, I would like to um, ask you, what was your design? Uh, what was your path to becoming a designer? And then once you discover that you really want to be a designer, what's the path? How did the path to mastery look like after that? Uh, Paula, would you like to tell us a little bit about your journey to becoming a UX designer? Absolutely. Uh, so honestly, I never thought about it. <laughs> I, I'm actually a computer scientist. So I started being a designer by chance. Actually, okay. I always loved beautiful things. And uh, yeah, and I wanted also to, to experience beautiful things in life. So I ended up working in an interaction design team as the most technical person. And that's how it all started. So for me, I've been learning by doing and just connecting like the dots. If I look back, it was just somehow by chance. And then with a lot of effort and putting a lot of attention to, to that, it just built up. So sometimes it's good to, to follow, follow your instincts and your chances, no, in life. Nice. You use that uh, uh, phrase from Steve Jobs, like you can only connect the dots looking backward, not uh, forward. So I think there's like a little bit of uh, uh, <laughs> influence there, I can see. <laughs> Lena, oh, throw, totally. I cannot even tell you. I mean, not just by, by his way of living, but also because one of his favorite books, uh, Autobiography of a Yogi, is one of my favorite books as well. And I never knew that. Uh, I mean, like, it was just by chance as well. So yeah, he has also a strong connection with yoga and India. So absolutely. <laughs> oh, when I met you, I knew that you were amazing, but this just confirms it in a way. <laughs> uh, Leonardo, would you like to go next? Yes, yes. Uh, so there's a thing like when I stopped to, to, to play football, <laughs> I was working as a teacher for kids, but one of my main hobbies, it was solving puzzles. Like I really love puzzles. Uh, and I started to study uh, again, uh, more or less by chance. I saw a course of designing in Brazil and say, yeah, let's do this course. Let's see how it will look like. And I figured out like I was basically solving puzzles all the time <laughs> like building a product building a, a design is basically solving a big puzzle that in the end of the day we also solve a problem from from the user you know and i get in love with that i saw then i i can i can solve puzzles the whole day and this could be pay my bills so let's go for it <laughs> and then i jump in the, into this field like yeah i i i really love what i do <laughs> i feel i'm still solving puzzles sometimes a high complex ones Cool. Then there are ordinary people who hate problems and avoid them sometimes at all costs. And then there are designers who <laughs> jump at every problem they see. Um, yeah, yeah, we enter in this mode, right? Like every time that I see something, I start to think, hmm, how can I make it better? <laughs> yeah, nice. <laughs> David, do you also like love jumping at the problems or yeah. what, how did your path look like? Sure. So I started to, uh, from the technical point of view, so uh, doing, a, a, I would say, uh, some hacking development. And, uh, and then uh, 10 years ago, I jumped into uh, 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 workshop facilitation. So uh, at this time, I was like doing some uh, serious game, you know, some icebreaker to collect, try to collect uh, uh, specification in a new way, a funny way, and to, to try to grab as much as possible information and then I've learned uh, first uh, UX design uh, on the web like uh, 10 years ago and now six six years uh, I'm really uh, focused on mobile application so which is now really the, the UX is really the key uh, of the success for our mobile apps great and Antoine um, for me um, the design uh, part was there since I was young, I, I like to to draw things, not maybe uh, mobile apps at this time, but uh, uh, it's why now I'm a, I'm a designer today. And um, what can say is like Leandro, it's when I see something that I can make it maybe 
to think what can I do it better. It's uh, it's like an everyday challenge and um, and solve problems and find solutions uh, for everything, not only for mobile apps but uh, for problems, uh, everyday problems. Cool. Well, thank you for for sharing uh, for uh, on on your design journey. Um, next. We would like to cover a topic of um, design trends, especially the design trends that we see coming out of the big tech companies. Um, Leonardo, maybe you can tell us a, a little bit uh, more about the, the trends that are shaping the technology today, especially those coming mm -hmm. you know, out of uh, the UX, for example, around the voice, around the use of the AR, VR, etc. Uh, well, there's nothing. I, I'm not speaking on behalf of Google. Uh, I'm just speaking like the the, the trends that I'm seeing uh, in my daily job. Uh, but I I saw VR. Like it, VR is a big trend, but honestly, I don't feel this this type of trend is uh, is being applicable to the products today. I see this is a very good trend for gaming and maybe like people interaction industry. Uh, I have a VR setup in my home and I love it. <laughs> it's amazing to play, but for products, for like daily products that we use uh, in our in our daily lives, like to do simple things, sometimes like to 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 open a bank, to understand our balance, to understand our money, uh, I see voice interfaces getting bigger and bigger uh, for several reasons. Uh, the first one is uh, it is kind of accessible, like you you can use it free hands and uh, could be very universally accessible, uh, but one big challenge for this type of uh, this type of interface, this type of voice interface, is to deal with diversity in the world, uh, to deal like with the different accents and also different languages, because you have to build something. Some, sometimes companies build it to for people that speak English, but yeah, we have different accents when we speak English. Even native speakers have different accents. And to make sure that your te technology is inclusive to all of them, we have to take this into account, you know? And personally, I believe like we need diverse people building these technologies. Uh, I, I see this as a trend. I see these voice interfaces uh, like home, uh, home assistants, like the Amazon Echo, even Google Home uh, or uh, the, the Apple Siri as a big trend uh, to help people to deal better with this technology. But what I believe is we need also diverse people building it to make sure that we are covering all the different access, uh, accents and all the different ways that people speak in the world. Uh, Otherwise, we could harm this innovation by narrowing this and optimizing it to just a way of speak. And I see this as a very problematic path that things could evolve in the future. But I do believe that voice interface could be uh, one of the main things in the near future. And I hope, I hope VR becomes a big thing, but honestly, I don't see, I'm not seeing anything yeah. big happen with VR outside gaming. Yeah, that's it. Uh, for me, it's the, exactly what you are telling. So, um, in my opinion, I would say the uh, some UX trends. So, first, uh, maybe the uh, micro interaction that today is not not a trend, but uh, is a, is I would say a standard. Uh, you need to implement. Uh, you need really micro interaction with people uh, when you do uh, really nice interfaces. Um, today, it's really, I would say, more uh, easy to develop and I would say less expensive to develop augmented reality. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and, uh, and I would maybe talk about some, some, some cases and what to do with that, uh, what to expect from those technologies. Uh, and maybe the trends for me now in UX would be uh, more everything related to ethical, uh, uh, everything which you can push some, some green uh, green IT uh, and uh, and make something collaborative with your with your customers, um, which for me is really a key now for the future, and especially for young uh, young people that uh, really are uh, would like to 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 find that uh, on products, and maybe uh, another topic which come back I would say uh, after a decade which is accessibility accessibility uh, uh, for okay for the web but as well for mobile apps so really what has done uh, 
uh, Steve Jobs with the iPhone completely uh, changed lives of blind people and people using, a, I would say, a smartphone as a, as a new tool which completely changed their lives. But now back, uh, I would say, there will be more public initiative to, to enforce companies, uh, as we, we saw with uh, GDPR, maybe to, to push more and more accessibility um, for any, any people. And, um, and maybe some concrete example about gamification, VR, AR. So for example, we have, we, we have created for two customers, uh, two, two main apps uh, using augmented reality. Uh, one is for a major retailer in France of uh, virtual makeup. So they, they are selling uh, makeups and we have creating like a, a virtual makeup. So you can test, uh, I would say, uh, uh, your makeup with your phone, uh, which with the pandemic was, was a good time, I would say, but was not, we, we never foreseen the pandemic. Uh, so uh, crisis, but uh, as well, uh, people need to, to see that it's not really something that will completely boost the, the sales. It's a kind of fire starter for empathy. So, I mean, if you, if you have such a, such a functionality in your app, it creates empathy with your customers. And uh, then it will give a, a good, I would say, a good feeling when you, will, when, when you will use the app for the first time. But that will really not boost, uh, I would say, uh, technically the... Um, the, um, the sales, but more create loyalty with them. And, um, and then, so uh, then we, we have created another app with augmented reality. It was, in that case, it was for a company in the industry uh, in the B2B 2C model, you know? And so creating an app to test some, some covers on walls, uh, if you make some renovation in your house, was a good was a good opportunity to um, to, cr to create more visibility on the product on the market, help uh, I would say uh, uh, companies that then uh, do renovation, but as well for the very end customer discover the product. So um, and again it was not really um, a, a direct sales revenues. It was really creating a, 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 a reference I would say and uh, and make your your product uh, known by people. Yeah, those are very interesting uh, use cases. Uh, thank you for sharing. Um, I, I was wondering around the, um, the scaling of the UX uh, as a practice. I know that uh, Paula, you're a director at the N26 and uh, you, you talked a little bit about, you know, how you come from a different background and so on. I'm wondering how did you scale the UX as a practice inside your organization? Because uh, right now, uh, N26 is really regarded as one of the companies that offer the best user experience to their customers. And how did you instill this practice of user experience across the whole organization? Well, it's a continuous evolution because teams somehow uh, adapt and flow uh, around the changes of the overall organization. No? So for design at this stage uh, at N26, um, it's uh, more about working closely together between different teams and really identifying with the, with the product team more than with the UX team, you know? And uh, really, really tackling together uh, problems, business problems, user problems. It sounds super simplistic, but it's, it's still at our core, no? So we can enable collaboration more, more and more. But for that, to be able to collaborate, uh, your boundaries have to be also very well set. Um, so the roles, the definition of what we do, the impact that we pretend to have, how do we want to be perceived as a team? So at this moment, um, uh, for, a, for, for, a, for the sake of scaling it up as well, uh, we are detaching a bit from, the, from a practice-led organization, like very focused on visual design and user research. Uh, towards going uh, to, to go towards a, a product-led organization. So different profiles, UX writers, T-shaped UXers, uh, also visual designers, uh, design operation people that work, work all together, um, but within the product team. No? So, so we make that team scale. At the end of the day, uh, our impact is on the product. No? So, um, so apart from that, uh, keeping the diversity on the team, like having people from diverse backgrounds, 
uh, that can add value from different type of industries um, and that are also um, yeah open to um, to share what they know and to learn from others also from a very attitudinal perspective no so so we look at hard skills uh, but we also look a lot to what we call soft skills that I don't like the word I hate. <laughs> yeah. So it's all about becoming a team and how can we together enable each person in the team to, 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 put, on, to put on the table the best of, of themselves. So honestly, the team is amazing. For, I mean, at all the perspectives, but this is at our core and that's how we want to, to scale the team in a, in a way that we feel one community and one team at a product level. Uh, sounds uh, sounds impressive just listening to it. As a UX designer, it's like kind of a music for my ear. <laughs> uh, Leonardo, would you like to uh, share a little bit from your perspective? You worked at the number of uh, organizations that are really are, I would say, uh, known throughout the world of having this uh, relentless mm -hmm. focus on the customer. So mm -hmm. what has been your experience from the ground observing how this companies uh, you know have gone from handful of employees but then scaling to hundreds of thousands of employees even mm -hmm. uh, and still remaining very much focused on the customer and not you know as Paula said going from a function uh, led organization to the product led organization mm -hmm. how do you capture that voice of the customer how do you instill it in uh, different teams and how do you maintain the focus on the product yeah, the, the first principle that we use, uh, at least I, I, we, I talk a lot about it with my team, is like uh, when you hear some, uh, when we hear some feedback from some customer, it's not someone else's problem, like never. It's a team problem and uh, everyone should uh, should look to this, to this feedback that comes from several sources like research, sometimes online feedback, sometimes someone, uh, someone sent an email or something like that. It's not someone else's problems. It's like, okay, someone tells that, what should you do to solve it? And we have a diverse, uh, uh, a diverse setup of people inside the team. And I would say uh, a UX today exists in three pillars. Uh, we have the technology pillar. So all the UX solutions should be uh, feasible with the technology that you have available today. We have the business pillar. So solving that problem should matter for your business. Uh, and we, ha we have the people pillar. Like we should make a difference in a people's life. And every time that we think about a solution, it's these three pillars that are in place. So how can we solve the problem from people how can you solve a people problem with the technology that we have available with the technology that they have available today and with the business model that you have available today uh, and you use those three uh, three ways to tackle the problem in a way that to make a difference in the in the consumer's life i would say and, uh, and when you start to think about it uh, we starting to think ux as like a philosophy so I like to say this like everyone is a UXer because a technology decision will impact the experience that people have using the product. And also a business model will impact the experience that people have using the product. And when you set up this mindset, I allow everyone in my team to say, hey, I'm solving a people pro problem with the skills that I have. Like I, Leandro, as a UX designer, I have a different set of skills of the developer that sit sits with myself. but do not mean that because of this different skill set, we are not solving the same problem. We are, we just have a different point of view of it. And I think being able to transition between these three pillars is what will make a difference uh, in the future of UX practice and also what we make us successful as UXers. Perfect, perfect. And David, uh, you've uh, worked with many, many different clients. And so you've seen many different organizations. What has been your experience uh, seeing things from the ground, uh, from different clients. Is uh, the UX adoption there? Um, are we reaching some levels of awareness inside these organizations? Where do we stand? So, yeah, for you to know, so we, have, we are an agency. So, uh, for example, in 2020, last year, we, we built up more than 80 apps all over Europe. So we have very small customer. And we have very big customer. So, uh, and uh, and each time, so um, it's it's a bit like was uh, explaining Leandro is that we the 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 goal for UX is really to combine uh, technology, 
business and then people, uh, people that will use the product. Uh, and, uh, and so we saw so many differences between maturity of customers. Uh, I would say that in biggest company, it takes sometimes two or three years to, to come to a UX, I would say, approach. Because it's not only having a UX designer on the team, it's having like technical guys who will work with this UX designer, business people that will work with this, uh, this design team. And uh, so everybody has to, to go on the same way, to know the process, to know the tools, uh, to know the, the way of collecting information, of challenging, I would say, the, the roadmap of a product. So, and this designer cannot do it alone. I mean, he's not like taking white paper and, and trying to invent something. It's not creativity, it's methodology. So it's methodology on how to collect uh, the right information. And I would say, uh, that's really a personal opinion, but for me, uh, so now I would say, people outside, I would say, of the design and the development start to, to, to feel of what is UX design, st start to understand the, the I would say the potential of, uh, of what it can uh, uh, add to the product. And uh, with new, I would say, regulation, uh, it will be hard to get statistics on existing products because yeah. now you need to accept some uh, consent, you know, to, to say, okay, I accept to, uh, that you, you will bring some analytics uh, data. So to, uh, to then manage uh, to, to have a view of reporting on the what, how we use application. So more and more, we'll have to focus on uh, people. And so meet people, meet customers, uh, trying to use like uh, user group, user test, and imply it, it will more like a matter of people and less, I would say, uh, reporting analytics and uh, like, what, like we did in the old time, you know, because what, what we see is that what we expect that we lose like 45% of analytics in the coming year, especially for retailers. So then it's really hard to, uh, uh, from the tool uh, to, to grab feedback. You will have to ask yourself feedback from your customers and, uh, and then to engage some, some rework or some, I would say some, uh, some add-ons on the, on the product itself. Right, right. Of course, with the evolving uh, privacy policy, it gets, much more uh, trickier for companies to get the, the user feedback because even often if, if they are just capturing, uh, let's say the least amount of necessary information, they still have to ask uh, for consent and nowadays users uh, refuse by default. So having kind of a personal connection and a community of users becomes I think more and more important going forward so that you can tap directly into that community for user feedback. We've seen this with some big brands using, uh, let's say, Reddit forums, uh, Twitter, et cetera, to source um, uh, ideas for new features or simply to ask uh, um, customers to share the worst experience they had with the brand, et cetera. So it, it's, it's evolving in different directions. Um, on, on our last uh, question for today, uh, I wanted to ask Paula, um, how do you manage to recruit great UX talent? And how do you manage to keep the great UX talent? Because um, the market for UX talent is really competitive. It's the supply of the UX talent has been really low. Uh, the, uh, let's say, formal education for the field is just starting to emerge. So we are not uh, mass producing uh, UX designers just yet. So um, these profiles really come from diverse backgrounds and disciplines and, and kind of a self-taught most of the time. And yet you still do manage to uh, uh, assemble a great team of the UX designers. So how did you do it? What are some tips and tricks that you could share with our audience on attracting and uh, keeping the UX talent? Absolutely. So I, I'm, I, I'm on interviews all the time, hiring people. Yeah. So that's, you know, something I can, I think I like I can answer you like fresh from today. So uh, one of the aspects that I observe in the candidates is that first they love N26, so it's a place they want to work. And But I can tell you why. Uh, because uh, I think that um, the candidates somehow find a, a scale up, you know, it's a, it's a place where they can still shape things and have the opportunity to grow at a fast pace. And I also sense that um, Candidates in general, they want to have an opportunity to grow and also to shape things you know, in, in, a, in a way. 
Another, another thing that caught my attention is that uh, a lot of people I've been interviewing lately, they also want to build their path uh, towards a leadership uh, transition. Or they want to become leaders on what they are doing. And that uh, is also a very, very interesting point because it's not something that you can kind of read about and learn at university. Maybe you can, uh, and uh, yeah, they want to join for the experience, for, for the opportunity to learn by doing and for having uh, the exposure to those type of challenges. So from our side, uh, trying to offer programs and the space for people to develop towards uh, the career growth, towards becoming leaders, towards uh, growing internally. It's uh, something that we are putting in place, that we put in place. We are, we are also hiring internally first, giving the opportunity to the team to develop and grow. Um, and, also, and also, yeah, those points are super key. Another thing that is also important, it's on the ways of working. Uh, people want to join a place uh, that fits their standards of working, ways of working, like with the PM, with the technical people, that they can kind of solve problems and things like that, as we've been, to, uh, we've been talking about. Um, and another thing is, uh, I think, uh, joining a diverse team, like that you can talk and interact with people from all around the world, and that you can feel part of a community. So yeah, those are my insights. <laughs> and to keep people, um, it's about, at least from my perspective, it's about uh, self-development. How can we uh, walk hand in hand with each person from our teams to help them go through the, the, the problems they have today at a personal level? Because uh, we cannot create from just outside or using external things. We need to create from inside. So lately and after, uh, well, now in the COVID situation and all that, it's becoming kind of more and more uh, like a trend or stronger that we as managers somehow have to be coaches uh, to understand the different situations around our teams and around the different individuals. Perfect. Yeah, the self-development topic is, uh, it was always important, but especially uh, it has been in the last uh, year or two. Uh, it's been something where we've seen that the UX designers have uh, successfully found their place in the organizations, but as you said, they want now to go to the leadership positions, and this is where they really need uh, the help of uh, and the support from their colleagues. Mm -hmm. I think this is a very good uh, place to uh, end the, the panel and move on to the quiz. So um, I would like to thank all the panelists. I think we had a great discussion. I've heard so many uh, great arguments from all the side. I hope that for those that are listening, that you will take away something valuable uh, after this uh, panel. Please feel free to reach out to me or to any panelists if you have any additional questions. I uh, will be very happy to answer those for you, or uh, maybe once the pandemic is over, you can stop uh, by and have a, a coffee uh, with us at the Loft or PwC. Uh, Anthony, uh, please, the floor is yours. Of course, of course, of course. Now we want to see whether you have paid attention to Paula, Antoine, David, and Leandro. So before we go into the uh, one of the two uh, workshop sessions, the UX design sprint with David and Antoine from um, from NeoPixel or uh, building a culture of A-B tasks with Leandro Lima from Google. Let's go with, let's start with the quiz in about 30 seconds. We already have 13 people registered. Let me do a shared screen so that everybody can follow. Let me do right here. Let's go and here we are. Let's arrive, let's arrive to 20. Let's arrive to 20. Let's go. It's a fun quiz, you like it. Six questions. Okay, let's go up to 25. Let's go up to 25. I wanna see Pranjul Cha in it. I wanna see Pranjul Cha in it. Okay, four more. Four more, you got, you got 30 seconds. Four more. Come on guys, come on, three more. Three yeah. more. Okay, we start in 10 seconds. Five, four, three, two, one, let's go.
Here we go. Okay. Miss Alpa is leading already. A la second. Who's RVD? I told you, last name and first name. <laughs> Mr. Ala Balden is leading. Two out of six correct. Mr. Huge Defin. <laughs> okay, guys. We got AI, RVD, AI, first place. Alan Ballen. Huge Defin. Come on, guys. You got 90 seconds. Mr. Huge Defin is leading Alan, Alan Ballen second. E Dot, third place. And number one. Huge Defan number second. E Dot. Let's go, guys. We got 45 seconds. Come on, guys. 20 seconds. Alabal is still leading, followed by Huge Defan and Mr. Robinson, I guess. 10, 10 seconds, guys. 10 seconds, go ahead. Oh, there you go. Five, four, three, two, one. And we have a clear winner, Mr. Uh, Billy Porcotti. <laughs> <laughs> there was, was, uh, please introduce yourself. You can unmute and unscreen yourself. Please go ahead, Billy. Billy, are you there? Mr. Marcotti, please introduce yourself. Yes, hello. Hello, hello. hello. Who the hell are you? <laughs> I'm a young UX designer at Concept Factory in uh, Luxembourg. Okay. Congratulations. Congratulations nice. for play, playing the game. Uh, Armin, any question to, to our uh, to our winner? Yeah, I was wondering, like, uh, <laughs> uh, how how come? I mean, uh, it was so quick, so fast, uh, so much so much adrenaline. <laughs> like, was uh, I, I was just like taken aback a bit by the pace of this quiz. Cool. Tell us a little bit more about uh, yourself. I'm I'm curious. Um, uh, what do you do, and uh, what did you like about the panel, and so on. Um, yes, I like um, designing, solving problems, as uh, everybody said um, before. Um, yes, but the main attractive things for me uh, in the UX designing uh, process. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Well, thank you for uh, joining us today. Who was the number two, Anthony? Uh, unfortunately, we don't have. We need to switch into the into the workshop oh. session right away. But uh, to all the participants, thank you very much for taking part in the quiz and for everybody attending. So now, let's go over to the quiz. Uh, let's go over to the workshop session. So we got two workshop sessions to choose from. All you need to do is to go to breakout room and you can assign yourself. If you don't have the latest version, just drop uh, workshop one or workshop two in the chat. And uh, my colleagues, Daniele Calderai and Frederic Weimarskirch and myself will help you, will assign you. I'm really enthusiastic about it. I'm really enthusiastic about online experimentation, uh, scientific method, and also Formula One. So if someone wants to talk about some of these topics, just ping me on LinkedIn and they'll be talking for hours. Um, and the goal of this talk is uh, how a UXer can define, influence, and succeed in a culture of experimentation. And the short answer is by experimenting. And that's it if you want the really short talk about uh, how to survive in a culture of experimentation. But for the ones that want the long answer, 
uh, <laughs> uh, it will take a little bit more than two minutes to define how can we succeed about uh, on this culture. And the long and to start the long answer about how can we survive in a culture of experimentation, I would like to define a little bit what is an experiment. An experiment is an organized way to test one hypothesis. And the part organized is really important here, <laughs> uh, because the building an experiment it's not just sit in front of a computer and say yeah let's experiment on something and drop a bunch of ideas in the screen. Uh, we need to be organized. We need to be intentional about doing an experiment. Um, and the first tip uh, for a designer, for a UXer to survive in this environment is to co-own this hypothesis creation. Uh, to co-own the hypothesis creation, we need to work with, uh, I, I, I do not say own, I say co-own because I assume we work in a diverse setup of people. And I don't think it's healthy only the designer creating a hypothesis. In the same pace that I don't think can help, uh, is healthy, the designer never creating a hypothesis. I think everyone in the team should create hypothesis for us to test and experiment. Uh, because as I was saying before, we have different backgrounds. And if I, Leandro, a designer, propose a test, uh, create a hypothesis, I will be bringing some values that I have when I bring when I create in this hypothesis. And my developer, if the developer proposes a hypothesis, they also will bring their uh, their vision, their biases, and their way to work when they're creating a hypothesis. And this diversity is beautiful. So everyone should own the hypothesis creation, also a designer. Uh, and what is an hypothesis? It's a logical assumption about how things should behave. Again, the part logical is really important. Like creating a hypothesis is not just pointing what you want to happen or not doing wishful thinking. We, ha we have to be logical about the knowledge that you have about the world. Uh, so let's create a hypothesis. Here is one, right? Create a good designing and make users happy. Uh, is this a good hypothesis? Uh, no, <laughs> this is not a hypothesis. And if everyone says that, uh, yeah, let's do this and everyone will be happy or let's do this designing and everyone will be satisfied, um, we will not, we are not creating hypothesis. We are just uh, making a wishful thinking. And this is not an hypothesis. And a hypothesis has some characteristics that you have to follow uh, to do this A-B test. The first characteristic of a good hypothesis, it's it should be testable. So it should be possible for me to prove that the hypothesis uh, to, to test and observe the hypothesis happening. If I say good designing will make people happy, um, I don't know. Uh, I can test it. I cannot test it. Um, I also I cannot say if the design is good or not because I don't have a definition of good designing. And we will enter in a very philosophical conversation if uh, you propose this hypothesis to me. And also, I cannot say what means for users to be happy. <laughs> and if you come to this hypothesis to myself uh, when I'm working, we will enter in a very philosophical conversation about what is happiness. Uh, <laughs> because without these definitions, it's impossible for me to test uh, any hypothesis. The second thing is should be measurable. So what's the measure of happiness? I don't know. Uh, and this is probably very, uh, very specific to one particular person. I would say my level of happiness uh, it's not necessarily connected to designing. <laughs> and I also cannot say that good design increases happiness. Uh, sometimes good designing just avoids stress, you know, do not necessarily make people happy. <laughs> uh, and so that hypothesis is impossible to measure. And also should be falsifiable. That means it should be possible to look to a hypothesis and say, yeah, this is wrong. It's also, it, it should be possible to look to a situation where we try to apply this hypothesis and prove not prove, but observe that the hypothesis, it's not happening. Otherwise, like if you can't tell something is wrong, we also can't tell something is right. You know, so uh, the first thing when you write an hypothesis, you have to think like, how can I, how can I tell I'm wrong? Uh, and if, if it's impossible to tell that you're wrong, yeah. Uh, it's also impossible to tell that you're right and you will not open space for a healthy discussions about it. And a hypothesis also has an anatomy. The first thing is an hypothesis has this thing called independent variable. And the independent variable is basically what we are manipulating when we are designing things. Basically, what you're doing is your independent variable. I can say, for instance, I will make buttons pink. 
And when I say this in the beginning of my hypothesis, I'm defining that the color of the buttons in my signing is my independent variable. Uh, the second important thing is the dependent variable, which is uh, what will happen when I apply my independent variable? What will, will happen as a consequence of my independent variable? For instance, I can say that when I make buttons pink, more people will click in this button. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I have this people clicking this button or number of clicks in the number uh, on the button as my dependent variable. Uh, roughly speaking, the dependent variable is your metric. And to success, the second step to success in this uh, A-B test environment and this experimentation environment is co-own the metrics definition. Like uh, we as a designer should not rely on other people to tell what is the metric of our work. We should, uh, we should decide what's the, metric that, uh, what's the metric of our work. And starting the definition, because I like definitions, is what is a metric? And this is like a very, uh, low appealing definition, but it's what it is. A matrix is an imperfect number, uh, imperfect number approximation of some aspect um, of a certain topic, of a certain fact uh, at a certain place, you know? So imperfect, it's important here. All metrics are imperfect. Every time that we translate some complex thing into a number, we lose meaning. We make it more imperfect. And because it is imperfect, we use the statistics to help us to reduce our uncertainty. But we always will be a little bit unsure, <laughs> you know? And that's why the name of this, this talk is not how to be right, is how to be less wrong. <laughs> yes. We have to deal with this uncertainty. We have to deal with this and statistics will help us with that. I will talk about some very basic concepts in the, in, in the next slides, but yeah. We use the statistics to do that. And when you're defining metrics, we usually uh, go to this parity, like UX metric versus business metrics. You know, uh, It's very common for me to hear in some conversations about, yeah, let's think about the UX metrics on your product, or let's think about business metrics in a product. And my, my reaction when someone call something a UX metric or something a business metric is this one. Uh, like, no, there's no business metrics and there's no UX metrics. They are just metrics. And I feel it's very unhealthy, uh, especially if you want to work in a cross-functional team to separate metrics between UX and business because this could give an, a false sense that UX is something separated from the business. This gives us a false sense that, yeah, I don't need to care about business. I only care about UX. And also give a false sense for business people that, yeah, I don't need to care about UX. I only need to care about business. And I don't think this is right. Uh, I don't think this is healthy. I think this only brings division to a product team. We should care about both. Um, in a perfect scenario, we should care about good UX influences the outcome of the business. That's why I like to reshape this metrics definition. I like to call behavioral metrics. And basically, behavioral metrics are everything that you measure that is related about how people use our product. Uh, usually it's like frequency of usage, rate of clicks or something like that, um, number of interactions in a product, everything that could serve me as a proxy for motivation. This is a behavioral metric. And outcome metric. Outcome metric is the consequences of changing in behavior. You know, Every time that we change a behavior, we generate some type of outcome. And the consequences of this behavioral change is the outcome metric. And this could be, for instance, conversion rate. This could be engagement. This could be new users. I can say that I create a behavior. Let's imagine I'm working in e-commerce. And I can say that I create a behavior that motivates people to convert more, to buy more. Or I create a behavior that motivated people to cancel less or something like that. The golden pot here, uh, it's we as a designer, should designing to motivate behavior that create a good outcome for people and the, for the people and for the business. Uh, the outcomes are in the both sides. And I like to highlight people here because of uh, ethics, <laughs> you know. Uh, if I designing only to motivate a good outcome, we can end up in a very dark, uh, in a very dark way to work because 
we will care only about I don't know conversion itself, and that's not healthy. Uh, we can end up create by creating dark patterns if you look only to business outcome. I I say create a good outcome. It's create a good value for people that use our product and also for the business that is the business model that our product lives. You know, uh, and that's a law that I I have this. Every time that I talk about metrics, is basically when a metric become a target, it ceases to be a good metric, a good measure. Uh, and this is what I was talking before. When just generating some outcome becomes our target, uh, this ceases to be like a good way to measure our work. I like to say that my measure is making correlations between motivating certain behaviors and seeing certain outcomes, not only a metric, not only moves a metric, but motivates people to use my product in a healthy way that will generate a good outcome in the end of the day. Uh, and also, when you're creating a hypothesis, we should avoid this sharp Texas sharpshooter fallacy. Uh, what is that? It's basically a person that never misses a target if they never define one target. The history behind that is you're in Texas. I don't know about why Texas, but yeah, I read this. When I read this, they always use Texas example. You are in Texas and you see a person sh uh, shooting in the wall and you see the targets in the wall and always have a bullet right in the middle of these targets and say, man, this is an amazing shooter. They never miss the target. How they do this? And you go and ask to this person, hey, friend, how do you never miss the, tar the target? What is happening? And they say, yeah, Leandro, it's very, very simple. I just randomly shoot in the wall, and then I go to the wall and paint, and paint all the targets, and boom, I'm perfect. Uh, every time we do this, every time that we run an A-B test and don't select any metric, and after the A-B test is done, we just look to the metric that looked good to us and say, yeah, this is what I was doing, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. And this is very common. This cherry picking of metrics is very common. We have to define the metrics before even sit in front of a computer and start to designing the screen. I, 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 I will not say before I start to designing because I feel defining metrics is part of designing, but you have to define these metrics before starting to, 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 to do anything. Uh, the metrics will give us the, the will tell us the intentionality of our design. And also, if we're selecting the metrics afterwards, the chance of a false positive, it's really, really big. It's really, really big. So select your metrics first and be stick to that metrics the whole A-B test. If after the A-B test, you see that some metrics move it to some interesting uh, direction, you don't pick that metric and say, yo, I did it. You run the A-B test again with that metric become the, as a main metric, and then you verify if it's really moving, you know. Uh, so let's talk about some the, the hypothesis anatomy. I bring some example that we can use. And uh, the example is by writing better error messages uh, on our forms inside of purchase flow, we could motivate people to fix the mistakes quickly. This will result in fewer tickets on our support. Um, this is the dependent variable better error messages. Uh, this is what we're doing as, a design, as a designers. This is our intention. This is what we are manipulating, the error messages. Uh, this is the behavioral metrics, people fixing the mistakes quickly. And we can measure it by the time that it, it takes for them to, to realize that there is a mistake there and then submitting the form again, uh, fixing the mistakes. And this is our outcome, fewer tickets to our support, because this could uh, this could generate value to the company. This could generate value also to the user. Fewer tickets to our support could mean people are less frustrated with the errors in the form. And also fewer tickets on the support could mean company saving money. <laughs> you know, So this is the outcome that's good for people and it's good for the company. Uh, and this will could test through A-B tests. But there's also this another hypothesis, like by creating an infographics to explain our privacy policy, people will better understand their privacy policy. Uh, and this increase the number of people informing that they trust us. Again, dependent variable, we are creating better infographics, uh, understanding our privacy policies, the behavior that we want to motivate. And this is the outcome, more people telling us that they trust in the company. And again, an outcome that's good for people, they trust, they can relax and use our product, an out outcome that's good for us as a company, like we are providing a service that people trust. And after we run the A-B test, we have to analyze our experiment. And again, 
uh, we have to call on that as designers. We don't, we can't rely on other people doing this analysis. Why? Again, diversity of backgrounds. Uh, a PM, we do an analysis very different than me as a designer and very different than a, a developer. And we should do this together. First, to create a common language uh, for us. And second, to bring all these different point of views about what happened. And to start experiment analysis, usually start with these questions, right? What data says? <laughs> Show me the data. What is, what is telling? The truth is nothing. Data tells nothing, never. <laughs> it's just number. And number don't tell us anything. <laughs> People say things. We say things. We interpret the numbers and say things. Uh, every time that someone comes with analysis of an experiment, it's their interpretation. It's not numbers saying things, it's people saying things. So what we can ask instead when someone comes to analysis is, why did you choose this data? Why did you choose this metric as the main metric for you to monitor? How did you collect this data? Because there's a several ways to collect this data and every way to collect the data has a bias. <laughs> you know, if you collect the data in certain part of the product, uh, you did something. If you collect the data in the other part of the product, you have another bias, but, oh, sorry. Uh, no, yes. Uh, and also from who did you collect this data? Because who was your target? And again, if I collect the same data from one type of user, I will have one answer. And if I collect my data from another type of user, I have another answer. So defining who was the source of my data is really important. Uh, and this led us to this theorem called the Bayes theorem. And it's very simple. I will not enter in, in any math here, but it is a, a probab probabilistic theorem that says that the probability of an event based on a pure knowledge of conditions uh, that might be related of an event. And knowing this, knowing the prior knowledge of the conditions of that event is really important for you to look to the data and say, yeah, I know this looks right, but it's actually wrong. And I'll give you one example. Let's imagine you have a dog and your dog did a pregnancy test with 99% chance of detecting a pregnancy. And the test says your dog is pregnant. Uh, and you only have this information to affirm that your dog is pregnant or not. And you say, yeah, my dog is pregnant. Uh, it's, it's right. Let's start to treat this dog as a pregnant dog. But I will give you one extra information. I asked to this person, from who did you collect this data? And they told me that, a male dog. <laughs> this dog do not have an uterus. <laughs> it's impossible for this dog to be pregnant. Uh, and because of this new information, I know that that test that has 99% chance to be right is actually wrong. They, they, they follow in the 1% chance of being wrong because now I have an information about what user I collect this data and I know the chance of a male dog being pregnant is zero. <laughs> uh, bringing this to a real life experiment uh, example, let's see, oh, I wrote it wrong here. It should be a post uh, registering emails. Okay, let's imagine I'm running an A-B test in an email for people that, that register it in our product. So me, Leandro, I create an account in, I don't know, some, some app, some running app. And then I receive an email about, and I'm doing an A-B test about it. And the goal of this A-B test is to engage the new users. But what I'm seeing is new people registering when they receive this, this, this email. And I know the chance of new people registering when they receive this email is very low. Probably the only way of people registering when they receive this email is if someone is wrong with their registration. Like I have two emails and I realize that I did the registering with the wrong email. But increasing the conversion, it's very, very low. And knowing that I'm collecting new users from A-B tests on this area should keep in mind that, yeah, there's a high chance of I'm being wrong. So maybe I have to use another techniques to measure that. And there are other techniques. Uh, again, I'm not entering the math details, but there are techniques to measure that. But be aware of the probability of your metric to move, because even if a high significance, there's a chance of being wrong. Another bias when you're analyzing the metric, and again, from who you collect this data is this winner bias. Uh, let's imagine a scenario, like I love Formula One, and I'm analyzing the Formula One car that uh, won the race, and I'm trying to make this car better. And I saw this car, 
crash at sometimes during the race, but they still managed to finish and won the race. And I say, yeah, I saw this, some crashes at some points of the car, so I'll fix these crashes and make this part stronger. Uh, I'm not touching the parts of the car that actually will make them broke. I'm analyzing a winner. I'm analyzing the car that won the race even though they have some damages, you know? So that damages is not strong enough to uh, make them to do not win. <laughs> we do this. Let's imagine an NPS survey. We're analyzing the result of an NPS survey. And the survey is on a post-purchase area. So we are asking on the survey, we're trying to figure out why people will drop our pur purchase flow. But there's a thing, this NPS is only in a post-purchase area. All the motivations that people tell us in this NPS to drop the flow, it's not 100% valid because even though with these problems, they manage, <laughs> they manage it to finalize the, the purchase flow. So uh, all these problems is not problems, are not problems strong enough to make them stop to buy something. We need to find people that drop this conversion flow and realize the reason that make them drop so we are not talking about the winners. We are looking to the losers, I would say, uh, and figure out why, why did they lose? And this is what, where we have to make them better. But the thing is, if you analyze, if you only have the winner to analyze, and coming back to my Formula One car example, and I want to make this car stronger, probably I have to, figure, to look for problems in places that the car was not touched, <laughs> you know, because if, I don't know, if the car break the front wing and still manage to finalize the race, front wing is not a problem. Maybe I should look to the wheels <laughs> that was intact during the, the, the whole race. We also have the confirmation bias, and this happens when you're doing the analysis, and we are ignoring all the facts that says we are wrong, and we're just looking to that unique metric that move it to the direction that we want. Uh, this also could be a focus bias. Uh, we should look to everything. <laughs> and every, if everyone, everything, all other measurements is telling you you're wrong and you have just one that tells you you're right, probably this one is a false positive because when you cross-check these metrics with another metrics, every, all the other metrics that tells the opposite. And you cannot focus on just one. You have to analyze the whole scenario. That's why diversity doing this analysis is important. You know, sometimes I don't look to some particular metrics, nothing, it's, and it's not bad faith. It's just, I was not aware that it was impossible, that it was important. And my PM comes to me and say, hey, Leandro, I'm looking actually to this metric. So let's talk these two metrics together and see what's happening. And some very high level statistics, uh, statistics definitions and statistics terminologies for rationalized or metrics. When you're looking to this metrics, you have to look to the confidence interval. And confidence interval is basically the like, likely range for the true mean of my entire population. So if I have this data here that says uh, the daily new users is 100 new users, and this conf uh, confidence interval between 92 and 108, uh, that means my true result could not be exactly 100. If tomorrow I look to the same tests, and it says I have now 105 new users, it's still the same thing to me because it's still inside this confidence interval. If I'm comparing to an A-B test and the A-B test says, yeah, it dropped it to 95, it's still the same thing. I cannot draw any conclusion because it's still inside my confidence interval. And we also have the significance level to do the comparison. And the significance level is the probability that you're observing a real change when you're comparing two data that we collected. And rule of thumb, if there are no overlaps between the two confidence intervals, you're good, <laughs> you know? Because the worst case scenario of my variant, which is 113, is still better than the best case scenario of my base. So there's no overlap between the significance level. But sometimes it does have overlaps. And when it have overlaps, you have to do a significance test so that's called sometimes t-test. Uh, this usually is represented by the p letter. And we usually work with the 95% confidence uh, again, I will not enter in this mathematics, but you can enter in a website called Measuring You, and they have a pretty good calculator where you can figure out the significance of your test. Again, rule of thumb, if the significance, if the P is less than 0 0.05, or if the significance is bigger than 95%, you're good. <laughs> if it's not, do not means you're not good. 
just means the chance of you being wrong is bigger. Let's imagine I do an A-B test and I do the significance test and it tells me that the significance of my result is 80%, not, not the 95. That means there are 80%, uh, there are 20% of chance for me to be wrong. Am I okay with these chances? <laughs> if I am okay with these chances, go ahead. You know, I usually talk about calculate the risks. And if it's a, an idea that has a high risk, uh, you'll prefer a higher significance. But if it's an idea that has a lower risk, you can reduce your significance and moving forward. But there are also, uh, there's also this thing that I have to bear in mind that big significance do not mean big effect because you also have the practical significance. And that means like, even though I have a big significance on my test, maybe the change is not big enough for me to, to make a decision based on that. And I give an example on real world. If I tell you, I don't know if you, if you have kids, but if I tell you that your kid has the double of chances to have an accident playing in a playground, they play in your home, you'll be scary. You'll say, oh my God, double of chances. I will not allow my kids to go to the playground. But let's go to the practical numbers. The chance of a kid have an accident in your home is actually 0.2%. And the double of that is 0.4%. <laughs> the double of a really small number is still a really small number. And if I tell you that the chance of your kid having an accident in a playground is 0.4%, this is not strong enough for you to do not allow your kid to go to the playground. And this also should apply to a product. If I tell that I did an experiment to increase the number of daily users and I increase this by one, <laughs> maybe this is not enough. Maybe say, yeah, just one, do not make any difference. Um, so be aware of this practical difference, uh, practical significance. Uh, and then we have also this no inferiority test. I'll go a, a, a little quick about it because I have three minutes only. Uh, this is basically when you have uh, overlap between the two significance, the, the two confidence interval, the worst case scenario of my variant is not worse than the worst case scenario of my base. What I can conclude here, technically the change is inconclusive. I cannot say, yeah, it changes. The only thing that I can say is like, my variant is not worse <laughs> than my base. And if you're comfortable with this uncertainty and if you're comf comfortable saying, yeah, this, uh, this decrease my conversion to 95%, but the worst case scenario is 91 and the confidence interval of my base is 88, maybe you're good to go with that because you're narrow your confidence interval and narrower confidence interval tells you much more than a wider one. Uh, don't abuse it. It's not a trick to accept all the results. So you should inform in advance before you start your A-B test that you're not looking for a change, but you're looking for a no inferiority. And to finalize this analysis, like analyzing a data, it's converting data to a language that makes sense outside the experimentation environment. So one example, I did an A-B test and now I have to translate it. So I can say that there is a correlation between increasing visibility of error message and fewer people contacting the customer service. Yeah, this is translating the data to the real world. And this also comes with a recommendation. This is my recommendation as a designer. This is what I believe we should do based on the new information that we have. And you can practice. So go and practice analysis. Uh, look to the data and starting to do your own analysis, practicing that. Uh, do analysis together, because by doing analysis together, we will draw different recommendations. And also share your analysis, because people will tell you how wrong you are when you share it. And some tips to finalize it. Design it like you're right and test it like you're wrong. When you're designing, be sure that you're doing the right thing, but you're in test, change it ahead and assume you're wrong to remove your biases. Uh, experiment is a tool to learn, not a tool to prove who's right, right and wrong. And also, it's not a tool to make decisions. It's a tool to learn. Uh, it's a tool to give you information. You will make the decision. Don't allow uh, the data to make decisions for you. Uh, and remember, you are probably wrong because good designing is super hard. So there's many, many chances to be wrong. Just want to be right. Uh, and don't work to be right. Work to be progressive, less wrong. That's it. Sorry for the rush in the end. Thanks a lot. I hope this was useful. And if you have any feedback, just ping me. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I found it uh, very, very useful. <laughs> so definitely <laughs> bring you back for the slides. Where can I download the slides? <laughs> Usual <laughs> after the webinar. <laughs> yeah, we can talk about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>
Cool. Well, see you guys in the plenary. So let's speak about uh, design sprints. So maybe uh, I, I could ask you some question. Uh, do you know which company many imagined uh, the design sprints process and when? Maybe you can just answer to, uh, to it inside the, um, the chat. We have Google Ventures, AG Smart, Smart Google Ventures. Yeah. Okay, well, don't don't need to spend too much time on this question. So uh, some is right. So it was created by in uh, inside Google Ventures around 20, uh, 2010 by a, a, a guy named uh, Jake Knapp and some of uh, his colleagues. So uh, the mo the the idea of, about it was to uh, time constraints and reduce risk when big companies and startup want to bring new a new product and services on the market. So uh, to not uh, spend time uh, uh, and months on working on a product that maybe will not work, they decide to create a fast way to uh, design uh, to, 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 to design a, a process and to have a result in in, uh, in few days. Um, so uh, just to compare, uh, what we can see is that uh, design thinking process, classic process, is more like a marathon because it's it's it could work for uh, you can create, you could work on it for during month and uh, some, uh, sometimes on, on years, and uh, it's completely different from design sprint process because it's uh, during some days. Um, what we can see to uh, say too is the is not involving the development uh, part of the of a product, so it's just go from ideas to uh, conception, and it's it's uh, it's a cycle like this for from the step one to the step four, uh, and let's go deeper about the design sprint, so we will explain. Uh, or just remember all the steps that we are we, that we have in the design sprint session. So, can you just say how many times uh, uh, how long is the design sprint? Yeah, five days, two yes, weeks, five days, days, two weeks. So normally, yes, it's during five days. So, uh, and on each day, on each day, you will work. You will uh, work on different aspect of the of the process. So it's based on five aspects. So you have the understand of the of the idea of the the goals, the the process, the company that want to bring these ideas on the market. Uh, you have the diverge part that uh, allow people around the table to uh, propose a solution to solve problems about these ideas. Uh, you have the day that you will decide which one you want to to develop inside a prototype so it's the fourth the fourth part and the last one is the the day that you will spend with users to to uh, show them the the, pro the prototype and have feedbacks from them um, and that's it so uh first day so is the understand so like i said we have company and startup goals we have id goals and context so it's really important if you are if you are making a design sprint for another company that maybe you don't know what they are working for to uh, ask a lot of questions about that to be sure that you bring all the information uh, that could be interesting for the, the, the design sprints process. Uh, after that, when you have uh, this introduction about the company and the goals of the, of the, of the, the ID, you need to clarify which will which will be the user that will uh, that will be part of the of the product. So it's uh, it's uh, everybody will uh, say what he's thinking about. If it's a female, a male, if it's a father, a, a child, uh, whatever. If it's 
uh, relevant uh, with uh, his mobile usage or not. Uh, after that, uh, we, we need to uh, know what they need to do with, with this ID if, um, if uh, we uh, if we, uh, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, there it's more on the, I would say on the on the personas. So uh, when we identify different kinds of personas, that would be the the users of the the product or the application. Then we define for each typology uh, a main goal. So uh, such kind of persona will will use this product because of that. So that's the main reason of their usage. Yeah, and every persona has his own uh, goals and needed and needs, sorry. So uh, it's why we do this step. It takes hours to do it. After that, for each persona that we, uh, we focused, we try to imagine the best user journey that they could have on uh, the product, if it's an app or if a website, whatever. So uh, all these steps is for the day one. After the, the day one, in the day two, we will make the diverge part. So everybody will imagine the solution about what we said uh, the day before. So around the, the, the personas, the user journey. So uh, you will imagine your own solution, uh, develop the solution to solve problems. So you could have more than one solution for one problem. And you need to iterate it uh, then regardless of feasibility. So don't think too much about uh, technical aspect. You need to focus on the users and what they really need. So on the, on the day three, sometimes this could be already on the day two because uh, we, we go faster, it's not, we don't spend too much time inside the sketching part because uh, some clients are not uh, really uh, able to do sketching or maybe wireframing. So it's sometimes this part is going faster. So the first thing on the, the day three what, that we need to do is to vote for the best solution. So we select one, we speak about it, we, we maybe we could already think about improvements. Um, and after that, on the day three or the day four, it depends. Sometimes we want to, clients want to take more time on the prototype because they want to go further than just spend one day on, on it. So what we do is to, to take the, the, the idea that was bought the day before or the, or the same day, make some uh, optimization about UX elements that uh, regarding all the discussion that we have together. If we have time, we could add some UI uh, elements inside. So it's it could be helpful for for the user test uh, part because uh, some users are not uh, happy when they are seeing uh, gray blocks and uh, uh, not not colors or UI elements. And um, make a solution usable because uh, for the for the testing part, it needs to be. Uh, animate to be sure that uh, the users will, uh, we will get the, the best the best feedbacks from the users. So it just for, here is just an example of uh, a design sprint that we made in, internally about uh, reservation uh, workspace project. So it's, it's the kind of things that we could prototype in uh, one or two days after this day. So we are, we, we start the last last day of the week, so um, we are testing and uh, have some feedbacks from the users. So it depends on if we could make tests in front of the user with uh, in remote. So uh, we yeah. have a question, Antoine, uh, from Alex. Uh, what tool do you use for interactive prototyping? Uh, it's it's depending we can we could use um, for example sketch and bring it to envision to have interactive uh, prototyping but clearly uh, the trend for them currently the trend is uh, to use figma as a, as a tool because it's uh, it's like a once one step shop 
So you can do UX, UI, and after that, have a really good interactive prototype that look really, uh, looks like a develop, de de developed app, sorry. Yeah, and then you can uh, you can integrate uh, feedbacks from yeah, users, which is really from, practical. Yeah. So that they can put some comments, and then and you can go back to the design and make some uh, iterative changes on it, and then publish it uh, uh, right after the, the modification. How do we conduct user? How do we conduct a user testing if we cannot physically meet uh, with our users? Um, so there, um, we can use, so maybe I can take the, the, the point, uh, Antoine. Yeah. Um, so uh, we, we, we did that a lot uh, last year, <laughs> uh, for sure. Uh, we, we, we still uh, have done some, uh, uh, some prototype and, and some testing with, uh, with two people, uh, but it was like uh, a selection of, uh, of closed users. So it was like 10 or uh, the day after it was 12 users. Uh, but uh, it was not really, uh, uh, the, I would say, the, the, the best uh, solution to, to, to meet lots of people. Uh, so then, uh, I mean, uh, the, the best case is to, uh, to bring a panel, a, a panel of users from which we can send even uh, inter interactive prototypes. Uh, and then uh, you can even on the, I would say on the web, you can find some, uh, uh, some crowd testing platforms. Uh, from where you can uh, you can engage some people and uh, and and create I would say a, a predefined panel of of testers uh, that get paid for for testing some uh, some some prototypes or even apps like you can make even some testing of websites uh, so there are some I would say online solution to crowd uh, to find some crowd testing people. Yeah, you have an online survey. You can create create easily an online survey to have feedbacks from the users just after they, they play with the, the prototype by, uh, by the link. So, and uh, okay, do you also use Figma for user map? You could, but uh, mostly uh, we are using Miro to uh, animate uh, remote uh, design sprint because uh, you can easily find a, a standard frame that you can uh, customize for your needs uh, on it. And uh, it's worked perf perfectly. You have a lot of features inside uh, Miro that help to, for example, for make, it, make, make some votes, um, make some uh, comments uh, and uh, wireframe easily and stuff like this. So just let's uh, continue. So <clears throat> first, after that, we, you can, uh, we can exchange about uh, what's work and what is not working. So uh, with, with our clients, so um, clearly most of the time, the solution that we imagine in, in just five days works for 80% uh, of, the, of the concept. But uh, we have some uh, stuff that needs to be uh, improved uh, after uh, after that. So it could be improved inside another design screen, or it could be improved inside the standard uh, classic uh, design process, like uh, if just workshop after that uh, day's workshop. So yeah, it's only five days. Impressive. Sometimes, uh, like I said, uh, pro um, projects, just the design part of the project and uh, the ideation part of the projects could take months. And in five days with the design sprints, it's really, uh, it's take a lot of energy to, to go through this. But uh, in five days, you have a, a solution that uh, could work and could be tested. So why we are speaking about Design Sprint in 2020-21, because it's, it was already created in, in 2010. It's because now we have no choice to work uh, in, in remote. So um, for you, maybe, uh, are you more about the remote team? It's more your things or 
you are more like physical team, you prefer to be uh, in front of the people uh, to do that kind of uh, workshops. Physical, yeah. <laughs> physical, physical, physical. Yeah. <laughs> yes. But, okay, physical. Uh, we were we were physical before, but now uh, I would say that we we change a bit uh, our yeah. mind uh, because of uh, especially using this kind of workshop. Uh, so uh, uh, Antoine will give a few words about that, but. Uh, I was really like, uh, you know, using post-it and doing some workshops and try to, to meet the people. Uh, but uh, I really have to admit that uh, from all the, the workshops we've made, we were even more efficient uh, using, uh, using some remote design sprint uh, than before. So, so let's, let's maybe have a look yeah. on that. Uh, like David said, we, last year, we, I think we made more design sprint that we did uh, the past uh, previous years uh, since uh, I'm in uh, NeoPixel. So I think the, the use of uh, remote program like uh, Miro, for example, is, uh, it could be better than uh, just have a physical presence uh, for the design sprint. But uh, let's, let's compare advantages uh, of both uh, possibility. So can you tell me just quickly, what are the top advantages of physical design sprints for you? Just for- uh, just Yeah, because many of you said physical, it's better. So maybe you have a few, uh, few arguments about that. Let's say what you think is really better. Okay. <laughs> You, you, yeah, people, people focusing, okay. Yeah, be on site and maybe uh, feel like the, the customer environment. Okay. Okay. So yeah. You, you both as right. <laughs> so um, the first advantage we think is that you could discover the client and the environment of a, like uh, the company where they are they are working, the people around around uh, around this. You can create maybe a friend friend relationship. I don't know. This could be easier to to have that kind of uh, advantage. So yes, you have physical exchange in moments. So maybe uh, you will you will be easily remember some uh, uh, specific details during your design sprint if it's in physical because uh, you relate it to a, to a physical moment. Uh, it's you could have a better distribution of speaking time. It's not true uh, every time, but uh, mostly yes, because uh, it's a small panel of people and uh, we, you try to, to share it uh, uh, in the good way. It increased efficient efficiency by being together in a closed room. So you are not disturbing by uh, another thing that uh, child around you, or, uh, I don't know, uh, sound uh, at the, uh, outside the, your house, uh, uh, dogs, uh, dogs outside, I don't know, but uh, you are more focused when you are closed. Everybody is uh, inside the same room. Uh, facilitate the maintenance of the intention of each participant. Yes, because uh, like I said, you are not, uh, your, your, your mind and your body is in the room and you, you can see easily if someone is not following 
and give uh, enough inten in uh, intention uh, on what we are speaking and what we are doing. So uh, same exercise. So uh, what do you think is the top advantage of a remote design sprint for you? Maybe you don't you don't find some because uh, everybody votes for the physical one. Yeah, <laughs> but there is some. Yeah, true. Yeah, you you right, Maxim. Uh, so first, maybe you have less ecologic impact, so you don't take the the plane or the train or the car to move to the client place. Um, you don't need to uh, to reserve. Uh, a hotel room or stuff like this. You are involving the right people because uh, I think the clients know that uh, he needs to select the, the, the right person and uh, you will not be disturbing but by uh, people that are just moving in the outside the room and just want to, to go inside just to know what, what you are doing and just uh, want to share his opinion. Uh, easier to program because uh, even if it's a five day uh, design sprint, it's easy to block for, uh, for the client and for, the, for us too. Uh, less, less wasting time on non design sprint topics. So uh, I mean, you, when, when you make breaks, when you are in physical uh, design screen and you make breaks, you say, okay, it's five, five minutes, guys, just take a glass of water and we, we start again. But uh, clearly it could uh, take uh, 20, 25 minutes, 30 minutes just to speak on uh, the, the topics, but maybe not uh, on, on other project that you are working for, uh, on it for the clients. Or maybe just not about project, but uh, just about uh, food for uh, for lunch, for example, or stuff like this. Increase each person ideation and proposition. So uh, what we saw it's um, uh, when we are in physical design sprint, uh, some people are not uh, comfortable to share his opinion and share his ideas, and by the remote uh, design sprint uh, opportunity, um, you have a good way to uh, imagine uh, imagine uh, stuff and wireframes and, and uh, interface on your side and not be disturbing but what uh, people say, what we people do around you. And uh, same for what you are thinking, if you are not, uh, if you are afraid to speak or take uh, say what you want what you want to what do you think and and and, uh, and, uh, and stuff like this uh, you can just add some comments and it will be read by the um, by the the team that manage the design sprint uh, it's uh, it's another way to share uh, a proposition or uh, an opinion so that is what I say, optim optimize each opinion by using comments or post-its. And you can record the session and keep track of everything. So if you, when you are physical uh, in a physical design sprint, maybe we, when you will be back at home, you will lost uh, some, uh, some post-its uh, in the train, I don't know, in the, in the plane. And um, the, 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 in digital, the digital remote uh, design sprint is the best way to keep everything. Um, so the future of it, just to uh, for the end, uh, I know that everybody uh, say that uh, physical design sprint will be uh, the best solution, but for sure, even after the the pandemic and we when we everybody will be back to work uh, normally, uh, the physical design sprint will be uh, will be not so. Uh, 
important and the remote will take the place of the physical one. And uh, I think it will be like this for the next years. Uh, maybe one, one day we will be back on the physical one for some, uh, some, uh, some uh, interesting ideas or project, but uh, mostly even it's, it costs less money for the client and for the company that uh, manage the design sprint. Uh, the remote part will be uh, we build the we build the the main one. So that's it. Thank you for participating participate to our workshop. I don't know if you have some questions or some something to share with us. Yeah. Maybe you experience as well some yeah. some remote workshop or or you you can I don't know maybe you don't share the uh, this. Uh, um, this opinion because I, I personally feel that really for such workshop so I was so much wasting time on trying to uh, to guess what was right written you know on the uh, on, on the on the post-it it takes so much time then to to fill it back to uh, to uh, a numeric uh, I would say uh, version and sometimes uh, I would say you abandon some post-it because you're not, not able to read anymore on it <laughs> And um, yeah, and, and then really maybe the, the last point, which I, I was not really uh, uh, guessing that it could happen, but uh, is that with, uh, with, especially if you use Miro, it's really a great tool. And uh, we, we experienced that with very, you know, people which are not at all digital uh, fans. And uh, there was it was really easy for them to, to jump into the, the tool. And we, we found that really people were more, more i would say investing themselves it was more easy for them to write something and to uh, to put a post-it uh, whereas in the the physical world you have to you know you have to um, to stand in front of every people take your post-it and then argue your, yourself on it uh, so um for the timidity it was really um really helpful uh, i guess and uh, we we have much more i would say uh, ideas and people expressing themselves remotely because they, they manipulate, uh, I would say, virtual post-its and they can write everything on that. Uh, so we really think that it's, it's really more efficient, uh, even if we prefer to meet people physically. But uh... Guys, thank, thank you so much, David. It's time to wrap up. We are bringing you back to the, we are bringing you back to the main hall for the closing Let's words see. in 30 seconds, okay? Here's the countdown. Okay. You'll be brought back automatically, okay? okay? See you in 45 seconds. You can also leave the breakout room by yourself. Yeah, we, we don't hear really well the, the music today, I'm saying. Even the quiz. <laughs> last, last week it was really, you know, high sound, and now we, it's just it's like we are hearing from uh, from far away. Ah, I need to bring you it closer. Your own playlist. <laughs> <laughs> I need to bring it closer. So last words. I think we are all back in the plenary. So I'd, I'd just like to thank everybody again for uh, joining us today. Um, I would like to uh, just ask uh, all of the panelists to leave your contact detail in the chat uh, where you would like uh, others to reach out to. So I will share my uh, LinkedIn profile. Feel free to connect uh with me through linkedin um and please for the other panelists feel free to share your contact details in the chat so that uh, uh, people who have joined us today can reach out to you in case they have any questions would like to obtain a copy of the presentation or uh, anything else anthony yes Thank you so much. Thank you again to all of you for having been part of this exceptional session. We had Miss pa Paula Mariano on board 
uh, who's the uh, director of UX, um, global director of user experience at N26. Thank you so much, Paula, for being with us today and for taking your time out of your very, very busy schedule. You made it. We are very proud of you and very happy that you, you could speak to uh, our Luxembourg and international audience. Thank you, David uh, and, and, and Antoine, for taking your time as well to share some of your knowledge uh, with us. Same to you, uh, Leon, Mr. Leandro Lima. You've been fantastic today. Thank you so much for supporting us on this initiative as well. Of course, Armin, uh, thank you for, for moderating the session, taking time out of your uh, busy schedule at PwC Experience, from the PwC Experience.